So uh, now we're on through um, the types of classes. We can now start talking about unsupervised classification. So unsupervised classification is just identifying sort of natural groups of similarly uh, spectrally similar pixels or we sometimes think of this as structures in multispectral data so for instance if you were looking at the distribution of points or pixels within a graph again band 3 versus band 4 you might see structures you might see places and, and you will see places as we move along with this where there's a whole bunch of points so that's how we think about it is sort of a, a little structure within the data set and in general it can be demonstrated that remotely sensed images are composed of spectral classes that internally are relatively uniform with respect to brightness in several spectral classes i mean you generally don't have for instance you know you have fields of corn fields of wheat fields of soybeans you hardly ever see a field that has a mix of all three species right so just because the the world is organized that way images are organized the same way they generally tend to have different um, um, spectral uh, classes that are uniform with respect to each one of them and then distinct from other spectral classes and unsupervised classification is just the process of identifying labeling and then mapping those classes so unsupervised classifications are going to um, be um, more or less simple um, algorithms that don't require a lot of input information or a lot of tweaking as they run okay and they're just going to go pixel by pixel and identify clusters or groupings of data within what we'll refer to as feature space so assuming there are clusters apparent in the image data this is done by calculating the distances between specific pixels within this feature space and assigning them to cluster centers. The technique that I prefer um, is ISO data, the iterative self-organizing data analysis technique. Um, it only requires a few parameters. For instance, in the program ERDOS, it only requires that you tell it how many classes you want um, and a rule about how many um, pixels um, must remain unchanged between iterations. So this is, as it says, an iterative technique. It's going to look at the data multiple times and when each subsequent look um, is going to change the assignment of pixels to uh, clusters or classes. Um, when the amount of change falls below a given threshold, and the default is 95%, if 95% of the pixels don't change class, then that's um, the point at which the clustering process will stop or if the number of iterations the number of looks at the data exceeds a, a given number that you, you give it then it will also stop so you have to tell it how many classes you want you um, have to tell it what percentage of pixels um, can remain constant to force the uh, the iterations to stop and then you need an alternate criteria for that stopping the number of iterations so now we'll talk about feature spaces um, the way we've talked about spectral qualities so far has largely been using um, 
the idea of a spectral signature. That is, here we have three different um, surface types, soils, vegetation, and water. And we have the sort of continuous spectral signature, what the reflectance is as a function of wavelength. And then we have two bands there, band one and band two. Um, and we're gonna figure out how bright the reflectance is in each of those bands. And that's what the sensor is gonna do, right? It's gonna come up with a number that tells us how bright um, or how reflective a particular pixel is um, for a, a given wavelength, wavelengths one and two. So that's the sort of spectral space. On the right is the feature space. And in the feature space, we're once again plotting um, one band against the other. So wavelength one band and wavelength two band. And again, this is essentially, you're looking at um, bands three and four from Landsat, red and near infrared. And so whereas water has low values for both wavelength one and wavelength two, we can see that in the spectral uh, space, but then in feature space, that just means that that water pixel is going to be near the origin. Going back to the spectral space, we have a uh, sort of a higher value for soil in band one and a moderate value for band two. So what we're gonna find is, you know, Soil is going to have a high brightness in, um, in the, along the band one axis and a moderate value along band two axis and supporting the idea that this is a, a red near infrared space. You know, vegetation has low values or a low value for um, wavelength one and a very high value for wavelength two and so it's plotted you know sort of a little darker it's shown than soil um, in the feature space but much higher in terms of wavelength two so this is the two complementary ways of looking at the spectral qualities of particular uh, pixels or these could be averages for a given class. Um, they can represent different things. In this case, we're gonna talk about them or think about them as um, individual pixels. The way we use this feature space is we're gonna say points that are closer in feature space are more similar. Uh, that makes sense, right? I mean, it makes sense in either space. In the spectral space, if you had two lines that, you know, almost overlapped, then you would say, oh, those two things are similar. Well, in the feature space, that's all translated to where you are, what your position is. Um, and then if we have a unknown pixel, right? So here we have this peach colored pixel. We don't know what it is. Um, we can look at the distance between that pixel and known pixels, right? So that you can say, well, this pixel is closest to vegetation, for instance. Uh, I think actually it's pretty much equidistant. Um, and therefore, I'm gonna call that pixel vegetation at the simplest level. This is the role of classification rules is taking unknown pixels and comparing them to known pixels and assigning them a class. And, you know, we usually look at these things in two dimensions, but we can look at them in three dimensions as well. So here's, doesn't matter what kind of image it is, band four, band five, band six, and we have four classes, each one, uh, is denoted with a letter, it's W, A, O, or M. And you can see that um, in this case, we're, we're displaying the fact that there's variability, 
right? Because no two pixels, I mean, some pairs of pixels will be identical, but if you look in a forest, we, we keep using this phrase like near uniform, you know, not every pixel in a forest is going to have exactly the same spectral quality. It's going to depend on species composition, density, slope, aspect, all the things we've talked about. So um, there's going to be some variability. And, and whereas in the last image, we didn't look at that variability. Here we're sort of not only looking in three dimensions, but also showing you the variability. So now we have the tools in hand to start thinking about how we're going to do an unsupervised classification. And the first step in the ISO data process is we need to come up with a, a, a series of guesses about where the original class locations um, should be put. That is, let's say in this case, we're gonna have five classes for our unsupervised classification. Um, because those classes will be defined ultimately by where they're located within feature space, um, we need to have a preliminary guess at where those classes would be. And the easiest thing to guess is to simply say, well, they're going to be evenly spread within the, um, within the feature space um, relative to the mean and standard deviation of each spectral band. So here we're looking at band three versus band four. Again, we'll just assume it's Landsat. And this little hat-like shape um, if uh, this reminds you of the tassel cap, um, this is not a mistake. This is the projection of a tassel cap into band three and band four. Um, um, let's say that that line, that shaded polygon, you know, that's where 95% of the points are. We're not going to draw the points because that's, you know, it would just make a mess out of it. So that's where the individual pixels are located. 95% of them are within that little, that little hat looking object. Um, now we're going to add to that a guess about where the clusters actually are within that space. And we're just going to take the mean. You can see on each axis, you've got the uh, normal distribution. Um, with a mean and plus or minus one standard deviation. So 66% of the data will be included within plus or minus one standard deviation. And we're just gonna lay out points uh, evenly between minus one and plus one standard deviation from the mean. And we're gonna do that for each one of the bands. So you can imagine that you had a table and in the, um, on the, the top of the table, you'd have bands one through whatever. And, and on the X axis, you would have, I'm sorry, the Y axis, uh, the rows of the table, you would have class one, class two, class three, and, you would fill in, you know, for class one, the band for um, the value for um, band one for class one would be um, minus one standard deviation below the mean value for um, for band one. And it would be the same for band two, three, four, five. They're all going to be at the lowest end of the distribution for each of the bands and band two would be that next one. And it would also have um, that next higher value for um, each one of the bands. So it, this, in this case, it's half a standard deviation below the mean for bands one, two, three, four, et cetera, all the way up to plus one standard deviation.
So in the first step, we're going to look at all the pixels that are within that uh, within the image, and we're going to ask the question, which cluster mean position is it closest to? Okay, we're going to assign every pixel that's closest to a particular mean position to the cluster that has that mean position. Okay, so at this point, all we've done is assign those those pixels. So the ones all the way out at the the tails of the distribution, you know, the sort of the pointy bits um, at the three edges of the hat are going to be assigned to whatever pixel there, I'm sorry, whatever cluster they are closest to, um, even though they're quite far away. Because the rule is every pixel has to be associated with one cluster. We're then going to recalculate the average position of each cluster. And so, uh, in particular, clusters that are near one of those three edges or three points um, are going to be moved toward the the extreme portion of that distribution because now you have a whole bunch of pixels with very low values um, for the first cluster or very high values for the last cluster that are going to be taken into account for the average uh, of that particular cluster and in addition to showing these clusters, we can now talk about these ovals. And those ovals just show the 95% the confidence intervals for that mean value, okay? And there's some overlapping, okay? Because it's so highly variable, um, there are gonna be some areas where pixels could um, just mathematically uh, be assigned to one or the other um, cluster. And this is why as we go forward, pixels are gonna move back and forth between two clusters. So once we've decided or once we've calculated new cluster means for each one of the clusters, we're gonna do the same process. We're gonna look at all the pixels and then say, oh, well, now which cluster does that particular pixel uh, does that particular pixel belong to? Because the cluster mean may have moved far away from or further away from a particular pixel. So now another cluster mean might be closer. Okay, and so the process begins again uh, of reassigning pixels recalculating cluster means, and then doing a check to see how what percentage of pixels have changed class. And once you get to the point where you've met your criteria for the fraction of pixels that are not changing, or we run out of iterations that we've specified, we're just gonna keep doing this, okay? And as you can see, um, as you get, at least in this sort of imaginary space, um, this cartoon version of how the algorithm works, um, you now have classes that are um, um, very much associated with the three extremes of the distribution. You know, the one that's got low values for band three and band four, the one that's got high values for band three and band four, and then that circular one up there that has moderate values for band three, but high values for band four. And this is an example of what you would get uh, if you started not with five classes, but 20 classes. Um, and again, there's the distribution of brightness values, you know, say the 95% um, of all the pixels fall within that brown or grayish polygon. And here we've set up a series of initial um, um, guesses for the position and variability of each of the classes.
then after 20 iterations, this is, you know, at least in the cartoon version, what you get is individual clusters have moved in the direction of in, such that they are um, overlapping um, with most of the places where you have pixels um, associated with um, the image conditions, right? So like 20 has moved out to take over that one lobe that was in the data, 18 has moved out. Um, otherwise, you see they're mostly just clumped in the middle. Now these are two standard deviation um, intervals for those ovals. So there are some places where there just aren't a lot of pixels that don't have a class associated with them. So for instance, that area of, of gray space between 18 and 20, um, if you look at all the gray space, that should be about 5% of the data is hanging out in those areas and they've just haven't affected the individual cluster means or cluster standard deviations enough to pull uh, a class over to, to cover that particular area. Okay, that's the theory, and that's the set of images that are used 99% of the time to show the concept of ISO data. Um, what I did was to look at our usual TM 3432C, okay, just take a subset of that, and did successive ISO data runs with greater numbers of iterations, okay? So I started out with, you know, I just ran it once and recorded the positions of the cluster means, and then I did it twice and recorded those positions. And so you can actually see using this data set how the, uh, the cluster means changes as a function of iteration. And so in the next couple of um, um, images, I plot a white line to show the trajectory of each of eight classes that I use for ISO data. And then at the point where they end, I put in a black diamond. So you know that's where their final position was. And I then also put in ellipse, which depending on which one you're looking at is either one or two standard deviations to show you the variability of the final class. So here we have near infrared and red. Um, so bands four and three. Um, we have the white line. So if you look at say um, class eight in the upper right, you can see where class eight was originally located based on just the guess of the computer and um, where it moved over the course of the iterations that it went through until it finally winds up at that, um, at that black diamond. And then the circle um, shows you two standard deviations. I'm sorry, one standard deviation um, for um, the pixels associated with that particular uh, cluster. And so you can imagine, even though you don't have the larger number of standard deviations, that that cluster includes all the areas to the, the right and up from there, all those, you know, relatively infrequent points. Um, in case you don't remember, you know, areas in this image where you have red means there are a lot of points in the images. Um, areas where you have green or cyan or blue or purple, um, those are areas where there are not a lot of pixels. So cluster eight doesn't, the mean is not very far out toward those, that northeast, you can think of it as northeast or you can think of it as upper right, because there just aren't a lot of pixels there. The average position is still within that area where that's yellow. So you can see eight moves quite a bit and you can see five moves quite a bit and you can't see the label, but one moves quite a bit. The one, you know, down near the, the lower left-hand corner. 
but not a whole heck of a lot happens with the intermediate numbered um, um, clusters. So this is two, three, four. Um, they move, but in fact, in some cases, you know, they move one way and then they move another way um, and don't necessarily wind up, you know, class two essentially doesn't move at all. You can't see a white line there. It's all covered by black diamond. Um, but there's some interesting things that go on with, with clusters four, uh, six, and seven. Um, and they do move to, to fill in an area, you know, for instance, cluster six, I hope you can see that right there. It's the, the one that's, that's, um, well, in the lower right hand corner, you can see the last little bit there of uh, cluster five. And then right above that is where cluster six is. And you can see as cluster five gets moved out to take the position of high near infrared, low red, um, cluster six kind of gets dragged along with it um, in order to, to, as points closer to the center point of, of cluster six, um, become further and further away from the center point of cluster five. Then this is band four versus three thematic. So this shows you which class winds up in which um, or which cluster each pixel is associated with. You know, in particular, what's interesting is if you look at that first cluster down there at the lower left, you have the, the mean position of the um, that cluster has very little to do with, um, and if you go back one slide, if you can do that, you can see that down right near the origin, there's a whole bunch of points that are water points. And those are classified as class one, but in fact, the mean class one um, position has nothing to do with water itself. So in this case, you know, your, your, um, your thought as a remote sensing scientist would be, well, I just didn't put in enough clusters. Now you can see that we have mixes. It's not a clean, there's no clean boundaries between each one of the color coded classes. And that's just because we're only looking at it in two dimensions, you know, some pixels in some of these subsetted areas where there are mixed pixels would be closer to one or the other uh, class in some other band or set of bands. So there's no clean boundaries. If we had just used band four and band three as the class uh, for this classification, there would be clear boundaries, but that would have been not making good use of our data. And so this is what the classification winds up looking like, um, you know, band one purple, that's mostly water. It is also though dark forest. And you will find that this is a, a problem in any place where you've got um, well, um, the combination of well-developed forests and um, rugged topography that your, um, north-facing forests, um, so forests on north-facing slopes, will be very dark. Not as dark as water, but fundamentally, is, as you've been able to see with the unsupervised classification, the forest, um, forest is quite similar looking to water in the overall context of looking at all the pixels, okay? which is what the unsupervised classification is doing. It's saying, well, you know, we've got a whole bunch of pixels. All of them need to be represented to some extent. And within that context, these two land cover types are essentially identical as far as the algorithm is concerned. So we already talked about this, uh, you know, how many classes are enough? Clearly, the number of classes I used for this little example weren't enough because um, the water did not come up as a distinct class. It's actually, 
in these kinds of cases, it's very difficult to get water to come up as a distinct class. Um, but, you know, if you have too few, and I, I, we probably have too few here, um, you're going to have numerous cover types, real cover types in the real world, that are going to share a particular spectral class. Um, I should say that very often when you do get this mix between water and shaded forest, heavy, heavy uh, shaded forest, the thing to do is to take all the pixels that belong to those two classes and do an unsupervised classification just on those two classes. Um, so mask everything else out. Because if you do that, in that context, the distinction between the two classes becomes quite obvious mathematically. Um, so we have the, we've seen the case where there are too few. Um, if you have too many, you're going to wind up with redundant classes. So you might wind up with four kinds of water, which is okay, sort of in theory. In practice, you know, if you wind up with creating 70 classes, and you wind up wanting to recode them to say 12 classes, it's just a lot of, of manual labor that you have to do to you know, convince ArcGIS that it wants to do a, a recoding with that many classes. So either way, you're probably going to need to break up some classes or combine classes before you have a final product that you're comfortable with. The way that um, identifying each class, what that workflow looks like, you know, you start with in the upper left hand corner, your original image, you set up your unsupervised classification and tell it the number of classes you want and what the stopping rules should be. And then you get a, a basically just a black and white image um, in general, uh, where each uh, level of gray is just the average brightness of a particular class, but the, the data in the image itself is class data, which if you do a, uh, what's referred to as a color slice, you do this in uh, ArcGIS, right, in the symbology plane, and you assign a different color to each one of the values associated with the unsupervised classification, you see now you get you can see all the different classes. Again, that's not spectral information. Those are just colors that have been assigned to thematic classes. The next step, you'd make everything uh, a neutral color, white or gray, and change each one of the classes in turn. So in this case, I've made all the colors um, uh, white, and then I went back and made class eight green and just looking at the original image using that informal knowledge that i have about the scene i can tell oh well those are green agricultural fields and so for some purposes that may be enough um you know um, particularly if you know, for instance if all you need to know is you know, a, a rough estimate of how much agriculture there is in this small image subset, um, you might be able to go in and say, okay, well, I've looked at all these classes, one or two of them are clearly agricultural, and now I'm just gonna sum up those values. Um, to have a better notion of what your accuracy is for more, um, um, detail purposes, you're going to have to do an accuracy assessment, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. And this is your final, your final product. You basically just go in and assign class names. You can see that on the right hand side of that table, and you assign meaningful colors, um, and that gives you your um, unsupervised classification. Now, the unsupervised classification, even though it, it's giving us the image, um, 
in one, you know, one step. Um, fundamentally, what it's what it's done is assigned um, average and uh, standard deviation uh, vary uh, or variability of the reflectance or digital numbers for each one of those classes that we've now identified using the identification procedures. Okay, so that gets us back to the spectral um, signature for each one of those classes. Advantages of unsupervised classification. There's no extensive prior knowledge of the region that's required. Um, you know, knowing as much as you know about Fort Collins and the area around it now, um, you ought to be able to look at an unsupervised classification and assign labels to each one of the the classes, you know. Oh, well, that's horse tooth, so and it's class seven, so class seven must be water. And then you know you do a little due diligence to make sure everything that you've called class seven uh, is actually water. Then you can move on to your next one. Sometimes it's going to be more confusing than that, you know, particularly when you have questions like pasture or rangeland. Um, but um, you know, in general, um, you probably have a pretty good sense for what the majority of the classes are and where they are in this area. And if not, you know, get out, get out, travel around a little bit. Or that's a joke. Um, you know, you could use aerial photography, for instance. You could use NAPP um, or NAIP data and figure out what you're actually looking at and say oh well look i see you know there are cows being grains land there so that's a pasture area so you don't need a lot of prior knowledge of the the region the opportunity for human error is minimized what we're going to see with supervised classification is that the biggest source of of error you're going to have is just your ability to identify good training samples for the supervised classification and in general if you have something unique that um, you might not have considered like you know for instance um, what's a good one um, well like uh, particular roof types for instance if you had like a lot of red clay um, Spanish tile roofs and your you didn't necessarily think about that before you started the classification unsupervised classification is going to pick out that unique spectral um, condition and assign it a class its advantages are you know unsupervised classification are are rely on natural groupings or clusters and matching them with what's actually going on in the real world is not necessarily the easiest thing to do so spectral classes are are not necessarily information classes okay you have very little control over the image classes okay so for instance again i'll well let's see i'll do uh if we're doing mixed forest conifer forest and um, broadleaf forest um, you those the unsupervised classification may always determine those as um, a single class or it might just split it into two classes and basically the only way you can get finer control over that is by increasing the number of classes that you're using. Um, and so that makes it very difficult to um, come up with classes that um, you can rely on the definition. There's always a certain fuzziness about it. Um, and once you have an unsupervised classification, it's only applicable to the data you've used it from, okay? Spectral properties are going to change over time. Um, you're not going to be able to take um, 
the information from an unsupervised classification and apply it to another scene necessarily.